I'm happy. And again, good I'm evening, so everyone. Glad. Good evening. Good evening. It is good to see y'all and welcome to a new series that came from the people. Last week, we we're asking as we're finishing up resurrection. Um, what will be the next series? And the people on the call said, um, let's talk about women. Let's talk about Black women. And so there we have this series, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, the Bible according to Black women, womanist theology and perspective. Um, I want to begin with a prayer. It's a litany went, written by a good friend of mine, a womanist theologian, young Black woman um, in her mid-30s. Dr. Michelle Guidry, who is chaplain at, um, at, um, it just went out of my mind, Spelman, chaplain at Spelman uh, College, Spelman University at Sisters Chapel. So this is a collect she wrote. It's called A Womanist Litany. I'm just going to read the closing collect. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, O merciful and just God, just like you held up our foremothers, we know that you will hold us up. We thank you for holding us. We know that in the depths of despair, you are our peace. We know that in unknown waters, you are our guide. We give thanks for what we do not see, but know is coming. We give thanks for your unwavering love and just mercy. We call forth healing. We call forth wholeness. We call forth rest. Amen. 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 So a little bit about uh, the series, uh, as I said uh, last week and in church on Sunday, and also it's in the flyer, we're going to talk about womanist theology, which is a branch of theology that really views the Bible, Christian experience, and Christian tradition through the lens of Black women. Uh, this theology has become more and more important to me. Um, I was introduced a little bit in seminary in New York City, um, but it's really after um, becoming ordained and a priest that I have been really living into and researching what it is to be a womanist theologian and to lean into womanist theology. When I think about myself, um, the theological perspectives that impact me the most um, are Eastern Orthodox theologians and then womanist theologians. Uh, at least once or twice a month, I'm quoting a womanist theologian in my sermons, and most likely um, a Black Episcopal womanist theologian, either the Reverend Dr. Uh, Wilder Gaffney out of Texas, or uh, the Reverend Dr. Uh, the very Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, who's Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. So I'm going to start with um, uh, a video that uh, will frame our, uh, really frame the series and frame our time together. Let me share my screen. I was living in Detroit. I had heard Otis Redding sing it, and uh, I rehearsed it, and my sister came by, Carolyn, and she helped me put the background to it, and we came up with the cliche, Sock It To Me, she became world famous. The 
R E S P E C T, yeah, which Otis I, did not say. No, he didn't say that. I, I thought I should spell it out. <laughs> In case anybody didn't understand it. Yeah, I thought I should spell it out. Let me spell this out. <laughs> Well, then it was kind of, uh, as you say, a woman's anthem, a battle cry, um, a ma mantra. Um, but everyone wants respect. Everyone needs respect from the young to the very old and in the middle, male, female. Uh, we all want respect and we all want to be appreciated. So it pretty much means the same thing to me now that it did then. little background to a song that we all know so well, Aretha Franklin's R-E-S-P-E-C-T, um, a remake of uh, that Otis Redding song, 1966-67. Um, uh, um, he wrote it actually as um, uh, a song that painted Black women in, in not the most positive of lights. Um, and then you have Aretha the following year reclaiming it. Um, and uh, making uh, one of the greatest songs, certainly of the past century. She was the first woman, uh, black woman inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And at her induction, um, they mentioned um, her song, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. So to talk a little bit about um, womanist theology, I have a video from, um, that features some theologians from Union Seminary in New York City. Uh, just to talk a little bit about uh, womanist theology. Uh, womanism is taken from Alice Walker's poem. Alice Walker uh, wrote a book, uh, In Search of Our Mother's Garden. Um, and in that book, she uses a term that's um, familiar to most Southern Black women, uh, womanish. Um, that's the opposite of girlish. Uh, to be girlish is to be frivolous, irresponsible, not serious. But to be womanish, womanish uh, is to be into grown-up things, uh, to act grown-up, to be responsible, to be in charge, um, to be serious. And so uh, in that book, In Our Mother's Garden, um, she invokes this term well-known by Black women, womanish, um, and actually that is taken on by the larger culture, which uses it um, really as a way to think about community empowerment. And in some respects is a little bit different from feminist. Um, some would argue that feminism has as its goal um, to uplift women um, and to some extent to be against men. That, that's not always the true. Uh, uh, true but um, some categorize feminism that way. Uh, womanism is of course concerned about uplifting women, but to be truthful and honest, it is about uplifting the entire community. It is not to be against men, uh, but to uplift your, uh, your spouse, your husband, your children, your, your grandparents, your siblings, the uplifting of the entire community. And so to talk about womanism, is to look at the Bible through the, the lens of, of black women, but really through the lens of community. You can think about that uh, West and South African statement, um, I am because we are. Um, it, a lot of times in the black community, you, you hear people say we is, which some people would say is, is grammatically incorrect. It may be grammatically incorrect English speaking, but from a theological and community perspective, it is completely correct because what it is saying is that I cannot be who I ought to be until you are to who, who you ought to be, that we are all connected together. Uh, we is uh, another way of saying I am because we are. I'm going to um, show uh, another video. This one um, is about, uh, 13, 14 minutes and really lays out 
um, what uh, womanism, what womanist theology is. If it wasn't for black women, not only in the church, but in society at large, we would not have a keen sense of what freedom is. The women ran the church. They did everything behind the scenes and everything on Sunday morning to get ready for what some might consider showtime. They just weren't in the pulpit on Sunday morning. And if it wasn't for the women, if it weren't for the strength and perseverance of the women, we wouldn't have the church that I knew. Black women in the black church decided to leave. I would basically take a text that says, finally, my brethren, farewell. Uh, because black women have so infused and energized the black church. And if it wasn't for the women, I wouldn't feel that women have a voice in ministry, and certainly I do. So womanist theology and black women are essential to the very lifeblood of what we mean by the black church, the black religious experience, the black community. They stand at the heart of it. For black women at the crossroads of the ivory towers of the academy and the stained glass windows of the black church, the 1980s was a time of self-definition. In 1983, the African-American writer and poet Alice Walker coined the term womanist. The creation of this confessional concept was a significant moment for women who found themselves called to teaching in the learned guilds of religion and to ministry in the church. You don't start off saying, let's be the ones to create womanism. So you find yourself in a particular context where there are no black women's voices and you, there's no scholarship by black women uh, and that you find yourself invisible and that you find your, in fact, that your voice is not wanted and not heard. Black women do have voice, even in an institution that said that we didn't, that we were not in history books, that we didn't have a place in the church. And it was through that engagement over a period of time of meeting other women who were in little silos of institutions or in churches that I learned the importance a voice for all people. One of Jim Collins' students challenged her professor by pulling his coattail and saying, hey, guess what? You black liberation theologians, you forgot something. <laughs> you know, to, to free African Americans who've been under oppression with the focus only being on freeing the male, you sort of left out half of God's creation here. Women all over the world began to challenge me, but it started at home with womanist theology and black women here at Union. Katie Cannon, Jacqueline Grant, Dolores William, Kelly Brown Douglas, uh, Joanne Terrell, all of these people contributed to my constant development of black liberation theology. A womanist tradition introduces a critical listening to all things. That's, that's actually challenging and I think probably strengthening to people who can no longer presume affirmation of everything they say. Women, that's one thing. Black women, that's a whole nother thing. Taken from the Black Southern expression, you act in womanish. Mamas, nanas, aunties, church mothers, and other mothers confirmed, critiqued, and challenged their girl children to ensure that they not only survived, but thrived in a world often configured to destroy their creativity, intelligence, and womanhood. The word woman is just caught fire for all of us. It was different from feminist. It was our word. It was what our mothers would call us, meaning that we were sassy, meaning that we were courageous. So womanist comes from the black kind of southern folklorist way of talking about you are womanish, meaning that you are fast. It means that you are bold. It means that 
you break boundaries and you don't mind doing that in order to accomplish what you have to accomplish. Womanism gave me a language. It gave me a way of naming my own experience. In a society that, that does not privilege black women's knowledge production process, but rather typifies and culturally represents black women as less or substandard or subhuman in a variety of ways. So while the term womanist was introduced to the world in the 1980s, its meaning encompassed the lived experience of generations of black women in America. Women who, like their biblical foremothers, were legally, socially, and even spiritually relegated to the edges of the church and society. These women, by mother wit, sheer will, and passionate determination, charted their own course rewriting definitions of what it means to be black, female, and made in the image of God. Katie Cannon and Dolores Williams, Joan Martin, these were the people that made me excited about being a theologian. They are the, the figures that gave life to my blood and thought this is what it means to be a church engaged. We're the only ones we've been waiting for. It's not going to change unless we change it. It's not going to heal unless we heal it. In my congregation, which is multiracial and multicultural, I lead my congregation with a woman of sensibility. We're always thinking about how to story the gospel by any means necessary. And in a multiracial, multicultural church, the conversations about race and ethnicity and difference and class uh, take on all kinds of um, nuances. And I think womanism, I'm thinking especially about Alice Walker's definition about we love all the people and we understand that our cousins are you know, pink and beige and chocolate brown like me. That has been so important to me as I think about rehearsing the reign of God here on earth and trying to help people understand what hermeneutics means. I'll have people in the classroom stand away from the window, stand back here, and tell me as you look through that window, what do you see? And they will give you what they see from this perspective. Then I'll have another student come up, right up on the window, who can see much more than the one from back here. And their description is so beautiful, widespread. 99 times out of 100, nobody will say, I see a window pane. Hermeneutic is what pain are you looking through? What is framing your perspective? And a female womanist perspective is not an African-American male's perspective. It's not a black liberation theologian, it's female. So the viewpoint of black women is essential for full understanding of what's going on in the world, as well as what God's spirit is trying to stir up amongst the people. Because women represent more than half of the African-American community and more than half of black people all over the world. So why are you going to X that out? You can't X that out. To X that out is to X out humanity. I'm glad when I called my first assistant pastor, it was a woman. And I had one of the leaders of the church, a woman, say to me, well, what are you going to do when you want a real minister? I said, pardon me? Because she didn't see a woman as a real minister. And, but I found that she was not an anomaly. She was normal. When women are called to preach, the first thing that we say is, no, not me. We wrestle with the, our own internalization. But as soon as we're able to push past that, Dare go into the church, dare go before the congregation and say, God too has called me to preach. The first line of defense is oftentimes one who looks just like her. Do you not know your rightful place? And of course, the, the very instinct is for us then to say, oh, women are the greatest opposition. Women aren't the greatest opposition, patriarchy is. I never will forget one Sunday I was preaching and uh, one of my favorite womanist scholars, my sister, who I love so much, I was up preaching and I made a statement uh, related to Sarah in scripture and she texted me immediately and said that you don't want to say that, that is offensive, that is oppressive. And the more I took a step back and looked at it, the more it dawned on me, I was a contributor at that moment through the homiletical moment to oppressing the dominant majority in the congregation. And 
as, as, as their senior pastor, I don't want to contribute to that oppression. So, so womanism helps us to reframe our language. Womanism helps us to be uh, more communal. It was seeing women in a church where the women led the deacon board, where there were women who flooded the pulpit and not just a male pastor as a figurehead um, there on Sundays. That finally helped me to open up to the fact that women are being called, old and young, married and single. Women are being used by God. And I finally accepted um, what I now know to be a call. The womanist tradition gave me more of a sense of urgency to lift the black church out of its sexist orientation. One lady in her 90s, I think she was 96 at that time, said to me outside of the church that day with such glee, I'm so glad I lived to see this day. I just thought it would never happen in my lifetime. I thank God that womanism gave me the strength to stay the course, that she would live to see that day and that I would be a part of her experience. What manner of woman is this? These are women who are bold, who are courageous, who are unapologetic. When I think of what manner of woman this is, I think of particular, peculiar, prophetic, passionate, prolific women who stand on their principles and articulate the wit and wisdom of black women before we came and make way for women that will follow us. You know, as somebody who steps into the church, I come as a lover. I come as one who breathes prayer because I believe it changes people and therefore changes the world. And I think that is womanist work. So what manner of woman is a womanist? A womanist is wise. Yes, she's radical, but she's traditional. Yes, she's self-loving, but she's engaged. Yes, she's subjective, but she's communal. She's redemptive, but she's critical. Womanism is what the black church needs. I would dare say is what America needs if we're truly going to embrace the best of who we are as a people who believe that we were all fearfully and wonderfully made and equally created by God. We must now honor, affirm, and support voices, womanist voices, and other voices who support a holistic vision of freedom and justice for all people. So the black church for me needs black women, but more than that, we need black women out front, leading. We need black women manifesting all of the gifts they bring to the table. And there's many doors left to open. We need more African-American women's presence in the student body. We need more funds to be supporting women to go into the ministry. We need more funds for scholarship. We need a whole faculty full of womanists. That would be glorious. When I'm teaching and preaching, I always tell people, we grow a God who starts with us. We don't know God except through how we experience God. So this place of lived experience and creating ethics in story has huge implications for the academy, but especially in congregational life, where our job, I think, is to grow a theologian in everybody who sits in our pew. Womanism is a mission to make the church whole again and to bring the wisdom that is necessary for us all to be liberated and for none of us to be left behind. I just want to pause right here and give you a chance to react or comment um, to either uh, of the videos or the songs or um, any of my comments. Just curious about what reaction you have. You know, Father, I think a lot of what they said is stuff what has always been, but just never recognized, um, especially when they talk about the women being the backbone 
of the church. Um, the first lady was the backbone of the minister and it just went from there. And some of those things I think, you know, I grew up with, but it just never had a name for it. You know, it was, it was how we lived and it was what we did, but it was never referenced as anything. You make an excellent comment, Ms. Phyllis. You're absolutely right. And you made a powerful theological statement. Um, it was already there yet named, uh, hidden in plain sight, not recognized. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, that's Jesus. The, the scripture for today um, uh, that we read at noonday prayer uh, was from Luke and the Pharisees go to the Luke, to, go to Jesus and ask, uh, when will the kingdom come? Oh, yeah. And Jesus says, the kingdom is already near you. It's already here. You, you just don't see it. And so you're right, Miss Phyllis, um, what we now call womanist theology, a womanist way of, of seeing the world has already been there. It didn't have a quote unquote proper name, but it was there. I think this gives us a chance to to <clears throat> to say it. You know, we may have thought things, too, but we were afraid or hesitant to say it uh, with true conviction. And I think a movement like this or the idea that there is such a thing as a womanist theology, you know, opens it to a broad extent for us to, to express and to, and to revel in ourselves um, because of that. Amen to that. The, the beauty about it is that the women now have more theological experience and um, and the women in the past was not able to they knew the bible but they were not educated theologically to, to say as much as these women have been able to say uh, you you're right Ms. Enid. Uh, i would say that um as time has moved forward there has been access to quote unquote more formal education. And I use that uh, in yes. quotes because mm -hmm. um, people have been educated. Uh, people have been great theologians. They just didn't have PhD or DD behind right. their name or any college degree at all. I can think about uh, my grandmother who finished eighth grade. Um, and I consider her one of the greatest theologians I've ever known. Uh, whose theology was always, thank you, Jesus. Um, and she did not teach at a seminary, but certainly taught me about the love of Jesus uh, and who God is. So you're absolutely right, Ms. Zena, um, that uh, from a womanist perspective, people have taken what has already been evident, and as, as Ms. Phyllis said, uh, named it and written curricula behind it um, and made it so that people can can understand and really get the word out. Because one one reason this resonates, I think, so well, uh, particularly with Black women or with Black people, is it's naming what's already evident. This is not an invention. Um, it's already there. There was not a, an official name for it. But when we see it, we know it. Just as an aside, Father, where is our only male representative tonight? So what'd you say, Miss Phyllis? <laughs> I said, that's the side. Where is our only male representative tonight? I know you they... were going to get him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we talked about the only male representative, I, but I can't remember. Was that last week? Help me out. Well, I don't know where they are. The, the, the two of them, Marion and Mr. Revy. Mr. Revy. That's right, Mary. Oh, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. You have you have to get after them. You, uh, you have to ask them where where are you? Did you <laughs> did you um did you sneak hmm. away? Who knows? What else? What are, what are the comments, reactions that people have? Um, the father, um, Glenda, uh, Glenda, I see you speaking, but I don't hear you. I, I have unmuted. Can you hear Can me? Can you hear me now? I don't know if I'm muted or not. I'll let Miss Glenda go first. Okay. Are you hearing me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
I had to redo my Zoom, so it's acting kind of crazy. Um, as I was watching um, the video, it, it kept bringing me back to, as a child growing up, um, I don't know about you all, but whenever I would go to church, usually the only man in the church was the priest. <laughs> All the pews were women. We were all the ones that were there. You know, the women cleaned the church. They did the altar. They were, they did the music. Um, and on the occasion that there was a man in the church, it was usually somebody on the vestry because all of the people on the vestry were men, but then the women did all the, the work. We were great theologians and we probably didn't even yeah. realize it or didn't even know it um, at the time. And like you, Father, I had a grandmother who was, um, not very well educated, but um, she was a great theologian and taught a great many people about a great um, deal of things. Um, and I think most of us, that's where we got it. We got it from those women who were the theologians, although they may not have had a degree of any kind, but they knew the love of Jesus and how to get across to everybody else. You're absolutely right, Ms. Glendia. Thank you. Um, okay, I was um, going to jump in here too and say that um, when I read Dr. Shaniqua's book about um, Too Heavy a Yoke, I felt so much of like her passion for womanist theology coming through just to be able to define Black women as women because of how in the 1800s and even more recent than that, the campaign was to really strip Black women of their belonging to that, to the gender. Um, and so for this term to just give us like more association with ourselves and our place is very meaningful um, and has a lot of like, impact for how we can rest from labor and enjoy things and you know not just be defined by the work that we do but just being in itself thank you for that lauren you're right there's power in not being defined by title or what you do or what you accomplished uh, but simply who you are, uh, just to be. One of the names for God um, in Greek is the being one. Um, when Moses asked God, what is your name? God says, I am, which means to be, uh, not to do. So thank you, Lauren. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I was going to say that um, the yes, Lauren. My name is Laura Swanson, and I've been Zooming your services a lot during COVID. So I wanted to join in on this um, series. Um, and I'm embarrassed to say that a year ago was the first time I ever heard the name Polly Murray. And uh, I've been an Episcopalian for lots and lots of years, but I never even heard her name. And uh, she's been a really interesting person to learn about. And um, I wish that the Episcopal Church would hold up more of the women who are, um, who, whose shoulders we rest on. Thank you, Laura, you're absolutely right. There, there are many Episcopalians and many people who have never heard of Pauli Murray. Um, St. Ambrose feels blessed that we were one of the first churches after Pauli Murray was ordained priest. She came and celebrated the Holy Eucharist and preached uh, to a, a crowd of, of almost 300. There was no room to sit when she came to St. Ambrose. Um, and we have pictures, one of the most famous pictures of Pauli Murray in the chasuble, that purple chasuble is taken right on St. Ambrose's altar. Um, St. Ambrose is also blessed with having another um, great woman. This is, this, is, this is using the term uh, anachronistically because it didn't exist, but Anna Julia Cooper, um, one of the great pioneers 
of the late uh, 1800s and I would argue most of the 1900s lived to be 104 years old. Um, great educator, uh, great Episcopalian. Um, and so those two women, actually, since they are saints in the Episcopal Church, we have icons of both a blessed Pauli Murray and blessed Anna Julia Cooper um, that are on our wall in our worship space. And Pauli Murray was raised in Durham, wasn't she? Yeah, so yeah. she was born uh -huh. in Baltimore, uh, mm -hmm. but then, yeah, raised raised in, in Durham, but has, you know, lineage back to the early 1800s with Chapel of the Cross. Um, and her book, Proud Shoes, which is where her autobiography um, talks about that. And um, her ancestor, Cornelia, who was the uh, daughter of an enslaved African and the uh, white slave master uh, was baptized at Chapel of the Cross. And so when Polly Murray became the first woman of any race to preach and celebrate the Holy Eucharist as an Episcopal priest at Chapel of the Cross in 1977, she read the gospel from uh, a lectern given by, uh, I think, Mary Ruffin, who was the quote unquote owner of Cornelia, her great, great grandmother um, in that historic chapel um, at, in Chapel Hill. So yeah, you're right, um, Ms. Delaney. She was certainly reared in Durham with connections of um, St. Philip's Episcopal Church, St. Titus Church, and also with Chapel of the Cross. Father Taylor, this is Karen. Um, when I, that video was, was great, by the way. Perhaps you can share that link later on so we can go back and really watch it and do up the comments. Um, but, but as I watched it, I also thought about women's theory in terms of how it intersects with, uh, you mentioned community and women in the community and how it was served. And I thought about the intersection of women servant leaders in the church um, and politics because women organized everything. And, and so when you had these movements, I'm thinking of the civil rights movement, women organized those. We serve um, in so many capacities. You know, we serve just like women serve in church behind the scenes. I think Glendia talked about that. They also serve in the church behind the scenes when it came to organizing everything around um, having political events and voter registration, voter drives, and, and all that stuff. And also, um, Laura's comments and Esther's comments about Paul and Murray. We can also see this woman, this woman, this person who was very active in politics. Um, and so when I look at this video, I just, in my mind, I also was just thinking about that intersection of not just women in theology, but women in politics and how mm -hmm. we serve our community and our church. Uh -huh. You're right, Ms. Thomas. And um, one of the things the video talked about, and I mentioned in my opening comments, um, really to try to frame the difference between feminism and uh, womanism, is that womanism is concerned with uh, the betterment of everybody, of the entire community. And so there really is not any boxing in. There is not uh, a religious corner, a political corner, a gender corner, a race corner, it's all together. And so to be womanist is to not only, um, it would, to be womanist is to take your view and experience of God and spread that through all aspects of life, um, which means if you're concerned with uplifting your community, then that's gonna be mean being politically active. We can look at uh, Stacey Abrams, um, and really this woman almost single-handedly, um, you know, gave, gave the Senate and the White House to Democrats. Now that's not a political statement. That's a statement of a woman who cared about voting and pounding the pavement. Uh, in the video, they talked about walking, the importance of walking, spirituality of walking, um, pounding the pavement, making sure that, that people's 
um, voices could be heard at the ballot box. Of course, we're seeing the backlash in, in almost 40 states, uh, more restrictive um, voting <clears throat> legislation has gone through. Really the backlash to this one woman, Stacey Abrams. So, And if I'm not mistaken, Polly Murray came in three categories, woman, black, and gay. Yeah, yeah Polly, absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, certainly she would just, she described herself as queer. Um, you, you, certainly um, there's not, not only gender identity. Um, I think if she lived in this day and age, she would not be she, but rather they, um, perhaps even a transgender person. So a very, not complicated, very complex individual, um, Polly Murray. Yeah, that's nice. Mm -hmm. But you know, we still have sexism in the church. Yeah, we do. Um, and one of the things, uh, Reverend Dr. Freddie Haynes out of Dallas talks, I'm sorry. Yeah, Reverend Dr. Freddie Haynes, but it was um, Jeremiah Wright of Trinity Church, Chicago, which is where uh, President Obama and his family attended when he was senator and community organizer. Um, Freddie Haynes said when he, the first associate he called was a woman. And a woman in the church asked, well, when, when are you gonna call a real minister? Um, and I'll admit, I, you know, I find that same sentiment at St. Ambrose. I've heard women, black women say they don't think women should be priests. Uh, and I've heard that since I've been here. And I've been here eight, almost nine years um, so we're not talking about like 50 years ago. Um, and I've heard it on several occasions from women who are leaders in the church make that same statement. Um, I, it just doesn't feel right for a woman to be a priest. But one of, one of the, what the video talked about is um, uh, the theologian, I think from Vanderbilt said, your, the response to that is not um, black women hating on other black women, the response is patriarchy. That a person who makes that statement has internalized patriarchy that it to some extent leads to self-hatred. But you know, Father, I was thinking about this. Um, there are places in the Bible that um, stress something about um, feminism and uh, the way people should, you know, I think the scripture that says wives submit to your husbands and stuff like that, depending on how you read the Bible, um, that can be used as a powerful weapon. No, you're right. And that's one reason some people don't, don't like Paul. Whenever we look at those scriptures, wives be submissive uh, to your husbands, that's Ephesians. Um, you can't just lift out that text, what we call proof texting and move on. You, you need yeah. to read the, the whole chapter. What Paul is doing is setting up his view, his view of how he thinks society should be, um, which is a patriarchal setup. But when it says, wives be submissive to your husbands, the next verse says, husbands love your wives the way Christ loved the church. What did Christ do for the church? Christ died for humanity. So when you look at that, that verse in its entirety, um, it, had, it paints a different picture. If you say, wives mm -hmm. be submissive to your husbands, period, that's one thing. Wives be submissive to your husband. Um, husbands love your wives the way Christ loved the church. Um, sacrificial love, sacrificial giving. Now, with that being said, it, it is still sexist because it's saying wives be submissive to your husband. Uh, yeah. Yet when you, when you read it in so context, the, the sting is not as bad. It's still a sting, but it's not as, as bad as if you just read the first part of that verse. Uh -huh. So we have about 15 minutes left. Let me, um, I got one or two more clips um, then we'll look at some scripture. We probably won't finish in this time, but we'll, we'll pick up next week. Uh, what I'm about to show is um, a short clip from 
a womanist theologian named Dr. Stephanie Crowder. She wrote a book, When Mama Speaks, The Bible oh. and Motherhood from a Womanist Perspective. When Mama Speaks, The Bible and Motherhood from a Womanist Perspective. This is an interview she did about five years ago. Um, I'll, sh I'll show two clips. Uh, and here is the first. Uh, this book is offering up and, and starting a conversation. Uh, and that's a question I'm going to encourage everyone to wrestle with once they've bought the book and uh, re rated and reviewed it on Amazon, because that's what you're all going to do, people. Absolutely. Yeah, um, but perhaps now you could, for now, you could offer up just a little bit of a hope you have for the book and its impact, um, either around for churches or for, for, maybe, for maybe young people like us who not yet parents who are reading it. Like, what, what are some of your hopes for it? Well, what I try to do uh, in the book is just, yes, you know, take these biblical texts, um, honor them in the context in which they were written, and own up to, you know, the, the challenges that, you know, the texts as they stand may pose, because they are indeed reflecting their own context. So, yes, biblical content as reflecting its original historical context. But at the same time, so, well, are there still some universal truths that transcend time, that sort of move beyond the chasm of time or the, the gulf of time and in some regard? Um, so that's what I was trying to do. Number one, recontextualize the biblical texts. I think number two, whether you are a mother or not, um, we all nurture people or we have been nurtured by people, we mentor people, we, we want to be mentored. We were born of a woman who is our mother, whether we like her or have a relationship with her or not. Um, so it wasn't, it's not about just if only if you're a mother, but you know, if, if you're, you're a spouse or your loved one, or if you're just interested in, in nurturing, you know, if you will. So I think it transcends um, or speaks to rather one's own familial status, whether you are a mother or not. And so a way of honoring family. I think secondly, I wanted to look um, at these mothers because I think motherhood is not monolithic. And so, uh, yes, we have, you know, Zebedee's wives and the phenomenon of sports moms. Um, we have Hagar. What does it mean to be homeless and displaced? You know, we, we look at women's shelters and there are mothers who are there who are homeless. Some of them are living in shelters with their children, but there are some who are without their children because the shelter won't allow the mom and the child to be together. Um, so looking at, you know, how do we take current day issues and put them side by side with biblical um, issues as well? Um, I look at, you know, Ursula Burns, you know, former CEO of Xerox. Well, then what is the story of Bathsheba? have to tell us about ways in which, you know, women are navigating and negotiating corporate ladders. Uh, I mentioned Whitney Houston and, you know, how even with her own struggles, she willed everything to her daughter, you know, Bobby Christina. Uh, so having the wherewithal to do that. Um, so I mentioned, yes, it's a different way of looking at motherhood because, yes, you have Michelle Obama, but yet you have, you know, Shonda Rhimes, um, who is producing, uh, who owns Thursday night ABC um, television. Um, so, again, just different portraits, if you will, of motherhood um, from those who are displaced and homeless to, you know, the millionaire types, you know, like First Lady of the United States, Michelle Obama and Shonda Rhimes. Um, so it's just different images of motherhood and how did I use, or my, my intent was to use the biblical text to reframe um, those different images. Um, even with the... That was one clip. Let me um, show another. <clears throat> there's up here again that's mm, great thank you for that yeah um well you in the book you explore uh several biblical mothers uh sorry and um hagar rizpa Bathsheba, mary the canaanite woman and zebedee's wife uh, so before we you know, get into this more specifically, you know, you obviously spent a lot of time with these stories of these mothers. 
Uh, and so I was wondering if, if tomorrow I could get you in a room with Ava DuVernay, who's the director of Selma and 13th, and you could pitch one of these stories and be like, Ava, I want you to make one of these. Uh, which one are you choosing? Sure. Well, you know, I was also doing great work with Queen Sugar also. It's mm. you know, um, a lot going on there. You know, I think, um, you know, Hagar's is she's adjudicating for son, Rispa for sons, uh, Bathsheba's for, you know, her son, her son Solomon. Of course, there's Mary and Jesus. Um, and Zebedee's wife is adjudicating for her two sons. I think if I had to sit in a room with Ava DuVernay and say, hey, let's, let's go with this story, I would choose the Canaanite woman. Because out of all the six that I've chosen, she's the only one who's intervening and adjudicating on behalf of a daughter. Um, everybody else, you know, in this sort of patrilineal, patriarchal, patronal society, it's about the sons. But here's a woman um, in, in Matthew's gospel and in Mark's gospel as well. It's, it's about a woman. At least in Mark, it's a Syrophoenician woman. But in Matthew, it's the Canaanite woman. So I think I'd go with the Canaanite woman and what she goes to um, the lengths and even her own sort of self-debasing, self-effacing activity on behalf of her daughter. And I think I'd also choose her because Jesus even concedes that, you know what? You got the best of me. <laughs> Here's a woman who verbally bests Jesus, if you will. So I'd want to see um, this story on, on the big screen. Yeah, I think that's good. When both characters change, you know, you've got a good story uh, happening. Absolutely. Uh -huh. All right. Um, again, that was uh, Dr. Stephanie Crowder interview from five years ago, 2016, about her book, When Mama Speaks the Bible and Motherhood from a Woman's Perspective. I'm going to put uh, on the screen the story she mentioned, which is Matthew uh, verse 15. Um, the Canaanite woman, and I'm going to ask somebody to read it for us. So let me share my screen. All right, so it's Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. Does somebody mind reading this for us? I'll read it. Okay. The Canaanite woman's faith. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from the region came out and started. Sorry, there you go. Started shouting, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon, but he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him saying, send her away for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And your daughter was healed and her daughter was healed instantly. Thank you so much, Miss Phyllis. Um, just curious your reaction to Dr. Crowder, um, her comments about the, the five or six women that she listed uh, that make up her book, When Mama Speaks. Um, and then I wonder if you all have any reaction to the story about the Canaanite woman and how Dr. Crowder said if she were to uh, convince a filmmaker to do a movie, it would be about that person because she is one of the few who advocate on behalf of another woman. She advocates on behalf of her daughter. You have to tell me, is Jesus calling her a dog? Well, you know, this gospel lesson came up earlier this year. Um, right. Uh -huh. And, you know, the, the position I take is absolutely uh that jesus is calling her a female dog um right. 
one of one of the things that the interviewer mentioned uh, and he said it briefly was both people changed after this encounter that the woman changed um, and Jesus left changed. Um, I remember in the Bible study, um, one of the, the people on the study, a, a woman said that she just had to read this over and over again because she just could not understand why Jesus didn't help the woman. She just couldn't understand why Jesus was being so hard. Uh, the woman comes and Jesus says no. And then the woman persists and then her daughter is healed. It's, it's a tough story. I, I argue it's one of the most challenging in, in the New Testament because we see this side of Jesus that we often don't see. Some people try to um, pretty up this story and saying, well, Jesus wanted to test her faith or he was going to do it anyway. He just wanted to make sure that this woman really wanted it done. You know, the text really doesn't doesn't say that. Um, no. Jesus was ready. He was to walk away. And, you know, this woman, she was an outsider. She was not of the house of, of Israel. She was not Hebrew. Jesus was actually in her homeland. Um, he was outside of, he was in another country. Um, and he's going to tell her how she should act, even though he's an outsider in her space. Um, and, and both Jesus and the woman left this encounter changed. Um. But she was persistent, she saw his fate, and she knew who to go to to help her. But how did she know that Jesus would have helped her? You know, that's the point. She had faith. I mean, she went to him yes. um, and believed that Jesus would heal her daughter. I think it's profound how Dr. Crowder says, you know, she lists up these five or six stories in the Bible yeah. to talk about motherhood and black women, Hagar being homeless. I think about the work St. Ambrose historically has done at the Helen Wright Center. Um, and to be quite honest, I've never considered the story of Hagar through the lens of, of who of Hagar is a, she's an African woman. Um, uh -huh. She's Abraham's wife, but she is an African woman. I've never considered um, Hagar to be homeless and that she was. And so black women experiencing homelessness now, black mothers experiencing homelessness now, you know, you can use Hagar as, as a lens to a biblical lens to maybe get some understanding. Um, you've heard me talk as we've um, been talking about one wake and the power movement in Raleigh. Um, one of the saddest things is at the end of a school day to follow a, a yellow school bus on New Bern Avenue and Capitol Boulevard, because you see them stop at these motels and all of these kids go out and, um, not because the kids are on vacation, that's where they live. They're technically homeless. And it's that hotel or motel that's, you know, really providing a roof over their head. Um, that's Hagar. And so again, the importance of black women's perspective in the Bible just cannot be understated. Miss Karen, I saw you unmute. Oh, I was just gonna, as you were referencing um, homeless women in Hagar uh, and watching the school buses um, on Capitol Boulevard. There's also the Salvation Army um, location right there where um, you see families. I recently did um, an event with an organization, um, Capital Area Section of the um, National you know, uh, Council of Negro Women. And we served about, I think there are about 24 families there. And one of uh, the mother, one of the young mothers had two children, a teenage girl and a little boy, very precocious about, I don't know, seven or eight, but he was just happy and he was smiling and he was waving. And, and in that moment, I thought, what joy, you know, he doesn't really know that. And, and maybe he does know that he's living in a shelter, but he had the, the biggest smile and was just, Brilliant and speaking to everyone. And in that moment, I thought about how um, we're so very blessed and have been. And then you run across families like this that you don't know what brought them to this situation, but you see these children and they're just cared for and they're loved and just 
for them. But in that moment, I just thought when you made reference to Hagar um, being homeless, I just thought about so many of our women find themselves in those situations with their children. I know she. I know she said Hagar, Bathsheba, the Canaanite woman, Mary. Who was the other one, Father? Before we leave, uh, Ritzpeth, who is Samuel. I think that's what Second that Samuel. Uh, R I Z, R I Z, P A H. Second mm -hmm. Samuel twenty-one. Ritzpeth. See, I have this book. I was looking. I'm just. I don't have a. R-I-Z-P-A-H. P-A-H, that's right. -A, -H, a grieving -A -H. mother. A grieving mother. Right. That's what that's the headline I have in my um woman of color Bible. Right. That's true. Uh-huh. And they have Hagar has been beaten and battered. Right. You, you know, I think that when we look at the story of the Canaanite woman, I think it's easy to look at what Jesus did, but I think it's also important to look at the fact that this was this woman was assistant. She fought for her child. And when Jesus commented to her, she came right back at him. So mm -hmm. she was not giving up easily, which is, I think, number one, something that we rarely see in the Bible. Um, but I think from that perspective, this was a woman who was fighting for her. And that's what mothers do. Amen to that. And Dr. Amen. Crowder would certainly underscore what you just said, Lisa. So we're a little bit past time. Uh, good discussion. We'll pick up next week. Um, some people have asked about books. I'm using books to, to um, prepare these discussions. Um, and I can make that that list available, but it's not necessary to go out and, and purchase a book and read oh. a book. Um, really, this is um, to bring awareness about womanist theology and to do what we did tonight. Um, have some commentary, look at scripture, watch videos, get reaction, um, just to see how this plays out in real life. Um, so what I'll do is I will close with the same prayer that I open with. This is a prayer from, from my good friend, the Reverend Dr. Nichelle Guidry, who is a womanist and is Dean of the Chapel at Spelman College, Sisters Chapel. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, O merciful and just God. Just like you held up our foremothers, we know that you will hold us up. We thank you for holding us. We know that in the depths of despair, you are our peace. We know that in unknown waters, you are our guide. We give thanks for what we do not see, but know is coming. We give thanks for your unwavering love and just mercy. We call forth healing. We call forth wholeness. We call forth rest. Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>